Jenny is the co-organizer of this uh, excellent uh, um, uh, session, uh, in fact the whole program. She's a senior lecturer in health promotion at the Faculty of Wellbeing, Education and Language at the Open University and has been working in this field of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, Win studies and uh, doctoral, had a doctoral thesis on cigarette smoking and identity amongst African Caribbean women and moved on to then uh, doing plenty of work around um, the importance of women of women's health and well-being research. Uh, she's been uh, involved in the aspects of, uh, of this for a, a long time and has been again advising the government um, on this and we're very delighted to welcome you Jenny to give your talk and we'll then ask you to hold on for the uh, for the discussion session at the end. Thank you Jenny. Great so um, so um, I was saying that the that, that the definition of African Caribbean is used by different researchers in different ways so I am using the definition of African Caribbean as somebody whose origins are in, who's, who's from the Caribbean and whose origins are African. We must be remember that, we, that the Caribbean is quite a large place and that, um, you know, for example, people from Trinidad and Guyana, Guyana is in South America, but is seen as part of the Caribbean, actually may be of Indian origin. So um, I just want to, to kind of set those promises. I'm going to talk a little bit about migration and black women. Um, I'm talking about black women working in the NHS and how black families from the kind of 1960s were seen as pathological and how black women were seen as fecund, feckless and fierce. Why there were higher rates of hysterectomy and abortion. I'm going to talk a little bit about the campaign against the use of Depra-Provera and black women's health activism. I'll just mention black mothers and childbirth now, and I'll mention COVID and I will mention environmental factors. And the reason that I want to take a historical perspective is perhaps to look at why there are some assumptions underlying our conscious or unconscious biases when we, when we look at black pregnant women. So here we see, um, black women migrating from the Caribbean. This was in from 1948. And that's why um, the terminology Windrush is used. The, the Windrush um, ship, the Empire Windrush ship actually blocked, docked um, at Tilbury in 1948. And that was the start of um, the Windrush generation. And it's interesting because the NHS was also established in 1948. And um, some of what I'm gonna say is gonna be a little bit political, I'm afraid, but Enoch Powell, the then Minister of Health, actually tried to get people from the Caribbean to come and work in the NHS. And we all know about Enoch Powell's legacy in terms of the, the, the rivers of blood speech. And following you know, migration from the Car Caribbean, we also had migration from a range of African countries for people to come and work in the NHS. The people that came from the Caribbean in 1948 were British citizens. And it was because of the, um, the immigration legislation, they were allowed to come to the UK as British citizens. And I wanted to mention that because I'm sure you will all have heard of the Windrush betrayal and what has happened to many people that came from the Caribbean. In um, 1981, the British Nationality Act was introduced and it meant that people who had come from the Caribbean actually then had to apply to be British citizens. So not everybody knew that that is what they needed to do. Um, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of personal anecdote while I do my talk. Um, my parents came from Jamaica in uh, the early 1950s. Um, I, my husband is actually from Barbados and he came as a child in, um, in the 1960s. And he was required actually to apply for British citizenship. Um, and this was... Um, not long after we got together. And I remember him saying, but I don't see why I should apply for British citizenship because I am already a British citizen. 
he did actually apply, thankfully. But many people didn't apply at that point because they had passports and they had come to the UK in the knowledge that they were British citizens. So as black families started to settle in the UK in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, we see um, sociological and policy work which kind of identified black families as single parent families, often mother led, so single mothers often saw um, black families as being led by teenage mothers, absent fathers. And there were many black sociologists, predominantly women, who actually challenged that notion of the black family. Beverly Bryan, Stella Dapsey and Suzanne Scaife in 1985 um, wrote a kind of groundbreaking book really, The Heart of the Race, which took from narratives of black women who are living in the UK. We had again in 1985, um, a report by Joe Larby on black women and maternity services. And I'll say a little bit more about this later on. Further work by Anne Phoenix, um, work by Melba Wilson and by Tracy Reynolds, all challenging these notions of black women and black families. But I think that a lot of the, the notions about Black women being fierce and fecund still persist. The women's health movement, which happened in the 70s, largely ignored black women. It wasn't just black women that the women's health movement ignored, also ignored um, women with disabilities, ignored um, women who were um, who, who were not heterosexual. And therefore, there was a lot of criticism of the women's health movement, although it made many gains. And so during the women's health movement, while white women were campaigning for abortions, in the 70s and 80s, we saw that black women were actually being offered abortions and hysterectomies, you know, often when they did not want them. And the um, reason often put forward was that that um, black women should have hysterectomies because they had a higher rate of uterine fibroids. That is still the case today, that black women do have a higher rate of uterine fibroids. And why black women have a higher rate of uterine fibroids? We don't have sufficient research to tell us why it should be the case. Um, I just want to refer to um, Sister Song, who in 2011, started the whole kind of campaign in the US around reproductive justice. And they said that black women wanted the right to have children or the right not to have children and to be able to parent the children we have in safe and healthy environments. And I think it's really important that we, we think about the origins of the reproductive justice movement. Here in the, the UK, um, the contraceptive injection Depo-Provera was manufactured by Upjohn. It was actually trialled in Jamaica, like many, um, many pharmaceuticals are trialled in the global south. And it was used in, 19, in the 1970s in hospitals across the UK. And it transpired that it was being given to black, Asian and working class white women without their knowledge or their consent. And um, the kind of view that, that um, people had about black women were that the racist cultural stereotypes of black women as unnaturally fecund breeders, able to endure more pain, less morally deserving of care and empathy, and finally, pathological women and mothers. And Brent Community Health Council, who are part of a group who are campaigning against the use of Depra Provera, in their report in 1981, they said the use of Depra Provera comes out of a very different approach to healthcare, an approach which accepts uncritically ruling assumptions in this instance, the desirability of reducing the black birth rates and the assumed ignorance and unreliability of black women and seeks to change people's behavior accordingly, 
whatever the suffering this may cause. And I mean, Brent Community Health Council didn't make um, that claim um, without foundation. If you remember, there was a whole discussion across the UK of black communities swamping white communities. I think Margaret Thatcher used that term. So in response to the use of the unwarranted use of Depra Provera, a, a number of people actually worked together. There was Brixton Black Women's Group. There was the Organization of Women of Af Asian and African Descent, um, Spare Rib, the magazine, and Brent Community Health Council. And they launched a campaign to make women more aware of the use of Depra-Provera among those specific groups. And in fact, what happened was that Upjohn did not get a license for long-term use. So their campaign was successful. And I, I want to mention here how black women actually have been organizing around a number of health issues for a very long time. Depra Provera being one of them, but they've also organized around the importance of um, people being aware of sickle cell anemia and um, hospital staff being appropriately trained. They've also campaigned around mental health issues. And now black women are campaigning around uh, maternal mortality. So as we heard from uh, Marion, black women are now 4.3 times more likely than white women to die from complications in pregnancy and childbirth. And this has been a slight improvement this year because for the previous three years, it was five times more. And uh, again, we have the activism of two black women, Tinuke Awe and Rebecca Abe. And these black women actually um, have worked um, with other groups as well to provide a petition to improve maternal mortality. And in June of 2020, the petition received 187,000 signatures. And on the 19th of April this year, we actually saw Parliament debating black women and maternal health care for the first time in its history. So I think it's important because the, the campaigning work of black women activists often gets ignored or kind of invisibilized. So not only did we have five times more campaigning, but the work that they were doing was being amplified by black journalists. We had um, programs on Channel 4, on the BBC, um, on, on Radio 4. Black MPs got involved. We had a number of black health professionals, including black midwives and doulas, black academics like myself. But I think it's really important that this work can't be left up to black women only, but black women must be involved in setting the agenda around work like this. So we've heard a lot about um, COVID this earlier on today, and we know that black and minority health and social care workers were more likely to die from COVID than their white colleagues. And um, certainly the, the uh, statistics that were produced by ONS around about this time last year said that black women were at greatest risk. They were 4.3 times more likely to die than white men and women. And we know that a black health worker died in childbirth. So I'm just going to pause there. We heard a lot about of the statistics um, in relation to COVID earlier on, but I just want to highlight two cases. One was the case of M Belly Mujinga, and many of you will have heard of her. She was the black woman who was working at Victoria Station. She'd actually, she had underlying health issues, and although she'd informed her managers of this, she was required to continue working because of severe staff shortages. On March the 22nd of 2020, she was spat at by a member of the public, a white man who said that he had COVID. Both she and her co colleagues fell ill with COVID and Bel Belly Malinga Majinga died on April the 5th last year. It's over a year later, nobody's been charged with any crime 
as the Crown Prosecution Service concluded there was insufficient evidence. There's been no inquest into her death, despite calls for a coroner's inquest um, from the union to which she belonged, which is the Transport Salaried Staff Association. And I think following a lot of lobbying, the coroner has now decided to hold an inquest, but we still don't have a date for that inquest. So I just wanted to, to, to actually bring to your attention actual narratives, cases of some of the people who died. Another woman who died was Mary Agyapong, and she was a pregnant hospital nurse. And she died of COVID, although her baby daughter was delivered by an emergency caesarean section. Now, she also tested positive for COVID-19 on the 5th of April 2020, and she died on the 7th of April. She'd worked until March the 12th, and again, she didn't really want to continue working because of staff shortages and because um, she was worried about what might happen if she didn't work, she continued to go into work. She was admitted with breathing problems on the 5th of April, 2020 um, to her local hospital. And despite the assessment that they thought that she was suspected to have COVID and she was heavily pregnant, she was sent home because she didn't appear to need oxygen. She was then readmitted on the 7th of April and died in intensive care on the 12th of April, although her daughter was delivered. And I've, I've raised those two cases because we've, we've heard a lot of discussion about why black and minority health workers, health and social care workers may be more likely to die from COVID. And to some extent, we've kind of tried to um, not to address racism. And by racism, I mean, not just interpersonal racism, but systemic racism. And in both of these cases, we, you have to ask the question about whether or not systemic racism was actually involved in both of these deaths. I just wanted to say that um, in, in preparation for a, a research proposal that I was submitting, I actually spoke to black women in community groups across the UK. So that was in Belfast, in Glasgow and in Cardiff. Um, and I asked them what their experiences of maternity care were. And they said they were not listened to by health professionals. That when they expressed their pain, they were not heard. That they were not believed if they said that there was something wrong, they were not believed by health professionals. And looking at other women who were in um, the maternity ward, they felt they were not treated in the same way as other white women. They were not treated with care and com compassion. And they very reluctantly came to the conclusion that they were experiencing systemic racism. I'm just going to read a quote now. This is from a 1985 report by Jo Larby. So how long ago was that? And she conducted research um, on black, young black women's experience of, matern of, of maternity services. Here she says, over half the sample found the attitudes of the staff towards black patients to be racially discriminatory, both overtly and covertly. The vehemence of the feelings, I'll never say that word, um, expressed about this issue suggests that these black women were very disturbed by the attitudes of health professionals in whose care they were placed in hospital. In retrospect, some of the women were surprised that they had passively accepted the way in which they were treated. The explanation given was that they found the experience of delivery trying and consequently felt too vulnerable, vulnerable to argue or complain. Now that could have been written today. Those of you who've seen the documentaries on Channel 4, on BBC, will have seen black women talking about the experiences that they had in maternity hospital. Black women who were sent home after birth and then had to be rushed back in because of problems. 
I want to go back to um, notions of scientific racism. And um, I know that this, this was kind of mentioned earlier um, be because I think that some of these notions that have been completely discredited underpin some of the views and the perceptions that people have today. So the antecedents of scientific racism began in the late 18th century, and it was these notions that underpin the transatlantic slave trade. Because I mean, if you are going to treat another human being as a slave, then what you've got to do is to define that other human being as not being a human being. And the kind of study of race in the 19th century kind of was, was um, prevalent across the kind of Western world. Joseph Gobineau in France, Robert Knox in Scotland, Samuel Morton, Josiah Knott and George Glidden in America, Charles Hamilton Smith in the UK, and James Carl Pritchard. And they put forward the notion of biological races as discrete and separate entities and argue that each race possessed its own distinctive attributes and characteristics supporting the notion that races could be ranked. And of course, with white races at the top and African races at the bottom. So we have the Caucasian, the Mongoloid, the Negro, Negro racial antipathy, the Negro race and racial antipathy was innate and natural. Now, although this was, this notion of biological and scientific racism was completely under, undermined by the work of Gregor Mendel in the 1870s. And he was able to show that there was greater variation within a so-called race than between them. So there is no genetic or biological basis for the separation of these so-called races. And that race is totally socially constructed and it has no biological or genetic basis. But these thoughts still continue today. Um, I want to mention Marion Sims, who in the 1830s to 1850s, he's thought of as the father of modern gynecology. And he de developed particular kind of medical innovation like the vaginal speculum. And he actually performed experiments on enslaved black women without anesthetic, based on the assumption that these black women did not feel pain. And there's a view that still persists that black women have thicker skin and that black women don't feel pain. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about interpersonal racism and then say a little bit about systemic racism. Research by Arlene Geronimus in the US refers to the notion of weathering. This is the impact that everyday racism or microaggressions have biological effects. And she argues that although race is not biological, that race is socially constructed, racism has biological and physiological consequences. And Geronimus argues that black women are actually seven years older physiological, physiologically than their chronological age. So we have interpersonal racism, and that's the kind of day-to-day um, -day comments, undermining microaggressions that we may all hear at different points. It's like people saying to me, oh, you do speak really well. And I'm thinking, yes, because I was born here in the UK and I went to an English school. <laughs> but still, people have a lot of ways of actually expressing their kind of um, their racism which is interpersonal racism. Um, we also have systemic racism. And that, by systemic racism, I mean the racist policies, practices and processes that are embedded within institutions like the NHS. And we need much more research to understand where and how racism is embedded. We need research to find out um, from service providers and policy makers as well as service users. And from this research, we need to change the training of health workers and reproductive and maternity service providers 
de develop appropriate training across health services. So um, I say it's the reports that we have from Embrace are really, really important, but we do need qualitative research to find out what black women are experiencing in relation to maternity services. And that this research needs to pay attention to the intersections of race, gender and class and the complexity of black women's lives. We've heard really throughout the afternoon that, that, that these issues are not simple issues. And as Audrey Lord said, we do not live single issues, single issue lives. So, you know, race and gender and class all intersect. And as they intersect, they kind of change um, the, they change the actual um, identities. And we need to factor that also, also into that issue of power and power relations. So we need research which documents and explains interpersonal and systemic racism. So I'll leave you to think about that. And then I'm, I want to now move on to talk about um, the last part of the sister song um, explanation about reproductive justice is that as black women, we should, we, the children that we have, we should be able to parent in safe and healthy environments. Over the last 10 years, black women have been more severely affected by the austerity measures. And I'm sure when we come to look at the research on the impact of COVID, we will see how it has financially affected black women. Black women are the women who are working on the front line. They are not often not women who are able to continue to work from home. So black women are often living in poor socioeconomic circumstances with poor housing and exposed to environmental pollution. And black women may also be more likely to be working in unhealthy and unsafe environments with exposure to toxic chemicals particularly those women who actually are working in, in factories, in the clothing industry. And, and actually, um, when we think about toxic chemicals, black women who are cleaners, we have many black women who are cleaners working in the health and social care sector. Black women may also be living in older housing. And, you know, we kind of um, forget that issues in relation to environmental um, pollutants like lead are still important issues in many houses. That there's lead from old lead paint and lead in water from old lead pipes in older housing here in the UK. In inner city areas with high levels of pollution, we have um, high levels of lead. And research um, in Birmingham has shown that primary school children could actually use six months of their lives due to the Ill illegal levels of air pollution in the city. And I just want to again introduce another narrative. And this is of um, a young woman, Ellie Kissy Deborah, and she lived um, close to the South Circular Road in South London. She died in 2013, having had seizures for three years. And um, the nine-year-old fatal asthma attack may have, it was thought that it may have been linked to air pollution near her home. However, an inquest in 2014 concluded that her death was caused by acute respiratory failure and severe asthma. Her mother, Rosamond Kitty Deborah, wasn't prepared to accept this. And um, she came across a 2018 report which said that it was likely that there were unlawful levels of pollution which were detected at a monitoring station one mile from Ella's home and that this more than likely contrib com contributed to a fatal asthma attack. And after tireless campaigning by Rosamond, the High Court granted a new inquest into her death last, well, May of 2019 and last year in November there was a new inquest and Ella actually became the first person in the UK 
for whom air pollution is listed as the cause of death. So when we think about all those different factors which impact upon black women, it's not just their socioeconomic position, their work experience, their home life, their migration experiences, their experiences of everyday racism, but also you know, where they live, their exposure to environmental pollution, that we need to have more research, which actually looks at all of these intersecting and interrelated factors. So we need more research on the physical, psychological, medical and emotional well-being of black mothers that pays attention to these intersections and to the complexities of their lives. And that this research needs to involve black women in order to unpick the harm that black mothers are continuing to experience. And um, it's interesting, I never thought that I'd be using this quote, but I wrote um, a book chapter for a book by Helen Roberts, edited by Ellen, Helen Roberts, um, called, and my chapter was Black Women's Health Matters. Now I wrote this in 1992. And I thought that by this time, things may have changed. And in it, I say future research is needed on areas already identified, but also black women must be involved in setting the research agenda and conducting future research. I go on to say many academic organizations are structured in such a way that black women are excluded from the research process. Academic institutions, institutions, institutions presently involved in women's health research need to give consideration to how structures will be developed to allow positive development of work in this field. And as I speak, there are 35 black women professors in the whole of the UK. And this number doesn't really seem to change very much because although new black women professors are appointed, black women professors leave because of, um, because of the racism that they experience. Um, there's a very interesting article that has just been um, published by Nicola Rollock talking about black women professors that she's interviewed. So we really need to make a change. Um, I wanted to, to conclude by saying that um, Leith Mullings, who sadly died last year, and Amy Schultz, and they're both um, anthropologists, in their work on intersectionality in health, they say that health disparities based on race and racism, class and gender and sexism are matters of life and death. And, no, and we can see that in terms of black women and maternal mortality, but I will also say that black women and maternal mortality is just one area where black women experience racial disparities and that in fact these racial disparities run right through their experience of healthcare and their experience of disparities in health and the COVID um, crisis has actually shown that this is the case. So I just want to conclude by saying we actually need more epidemiological research that takes into account an intersectional approach. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. What a hugely thought-provoking talk made, I think, all the more pertinent by the, uh, the individual stories that you highlight. That was really fascinating.